tackling tough topics to help you think reasonably about life's most important issues. This is Thinker Sensitive. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Thinker Sensitive. I am Ryan Ragazine. I am the host of Thinker Sensitive. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for supporting the podcast. Again, it means the world to me. We find ourselves now in the month of April, which is exciting. The days are getting longer. It's getting warmer outside. I'm excited. I hope you're excited. So let's jump right in today. We live in a world, and we've always lived in a world, that makes distinctions between people groups based on color and skin tone. Today, we tend to draw a hard line between people of color on one hand and Caucasians or white people on the other. This distinction is made on your driver's license, for example, where you probably have had to select an ethnicity from a list of choices like this. white. Hispanic or Latino, Black or African American, Asian, Native American or Alaska Native, or unknown. We act as if color only applies to certain segments of our society and certain demographics. In this way, we have a very narrow view of color, a reductionistic and limited one, I would say. I do want to quickly interject here. I'm not saying that this is good or bad, and I fully understand why we make these distinctions. And I certainly have an appreciation for all the social, economic, and political implications that are tied to these distinctions. But if we were to disconnect ourselves from the socioeconomic and political dimensions of human life for a second, if we were to transcend these spheres for a bit, The reality is that all people are people of color. The Pantone Company, a leading authority on standardized color reproduction, has identified 110 different skin tones. Let me read you a list of the 20 most common skin tone names. I'm going to butcher a lot of these. Ivory, beige, honey, peaches and cream, almond, chestnut, espresso brown, tan, caramel, bronze, mahogany, sable or sable, cacao, uh, C-A-C-A-O, cacao, I don't know, um, pecan, saddle brown, olive, alabaster, porcelain, marshmallow, and umber or umber. Sorry, I told you I was going to butcher these. It's important to note that many of these skin tone variations and diverse shades of color would fall under the broader category or sweeping generalization of white. The point is that, at least within the context of skin tone, without special consideration given to the historical, cultural, and political concerns at play, the term color actually applies to all people, not simply a few choice demographics. Everyone has color, a certain pigment or hue or tone. This illustration is of special interest to me because, though I'm technically considered white by cultural standards, I'm not really white, and most people don't view me as being white. I guess I'm what you would call ethnically ambiguous. My personal experience is really interesting. Throughout my life, people have assumed that I was Arabic slash Middle Eastern or Hispanic slash Latino or even mixed slash black. It really has depended on where I've lived. Growing up in Detroit, which I believe still has the largest Arabic population in the United States, Some people either thought I was Arabic 
or even a light-skinned black person. I get pretty dang dark when I'm in the sun. When I was a kid, I was outside in the summer all the time. I would get so dark in the summer months that paler kids in the neighborhood would actually call me pejorative names, often using the word sand before that notorious racial slur that starts with the letter N. When I was attending college in Texas, most of my professors thought I was Hispanic. Even mispronouncing my last name as Rodriguez on many different occasions. Even today, when I go to a Mexican restaurant, most of the staff assumes that I speak Spanish. And some of them are greatly disappointed to find out that I don't. But yet, by cultural standards, I am white. Even though I don't usually feel white, even though a lot of people don't view me as being white, and even though my skin isn't actually white. This has always been really confusing to me. But if you're confused right now, that is, if you're wondering what any of this has to do with the notion of faith, then let me get to that now. The argument that I'm making is that the concept of color actually has a very broad application, not a narrow one, as many suppose. In reality, the term color applies to all people, not just some people. It just depends what hue or shade of color you are. And the same is true for faith. When we hear the term faith, or we learn that someone is a person of faith, we immediately think of belief in a deity and the religious customs and rituals connected with that belief and participation in a faith community where people are able to freely worship said deity. In other words, like with the concept of color, we tend to have a very limited and narrow understanding of the concept of faith. In a reductionistic way, we typically only apply this category to those who are religious. Faith only applies to the religious person. Only the religious person has faith. We hold so many assumptions that are misguided. Ideas that we blindly accept and never question. Presuppositions and presumptions that we, ironically, except by faith. I've stated many times on this podcast that all human knowledge is faith-based. Today I'm going to begin to unpack this statement on a broad level. In the future, I'll probably get into the specifics. But this podcast is going to be an introduction to the topic, a teaser in a way. Historically, this concept is grounded in post-Enlightenment, post-critical, and post-modern thinking, which rightly criticized modernity and the Enlightenment for its overconfidence, naive objectivity, arrogance, and dogmatism. Now, I'm not a full-on postmodern thinker, but I do agree with many of the criticisms put forth by various postmodern philosophers. Like many movements in human thought, postmodern thought is a bit of an overstatement and a bit of an overreaction. But it can be helpful in swinging the pendulum to the middle as things begin to even out over time. Today I'm going to narrow this discussion to the context of belief in God or a lack thereof, to the context of theism, agnosticism, and atheism, mainly because there are a lot of misconceptions here. Before we begin, let's define our terms. Theism is belief in God. Agnosticism is the refusal to make a decision about God on the basis of a lack of information or evidence in either direction. Atheism is the belief that God doesn't exist. Here is my predictable but countercultural take on these three systems of thought. 
Similar to my illustration about color, faith directly applies to all three of these approaches to the question of God, not just to one of them. All three of these approaches are approaches of faith, expressions of personal belief, opinions, not matters of fact, reflections of human subjectivity, not human objectivity. But this runs against popular belief, prevailing understandings and misconceptions that, I think, are blindly accepted by faith. This runs counter to all the false dichotomies and polarizations that are created on this topic. See, the prevailing belief on the matter is that faith and reason are mutually exclusive, that they are divergent paths. We've come to believe that only the believer in God is a person of faith. Only the theist exercises faith. The atheist and the agnostic don't. In direct contrast to the believer in God, those who don't believe in God are people of reason. We even have this term believer, which is only used for the theist. Is this not the case? Am I misreading the societal sentiments? Am I misreading the tea leaves? Is this not what many people believe and assume to be true? The reality is that even the agnostic is a person of faith, let alone the person who believes, who has faith, that God doesn't exist. As an agnostic, which I used to be, by the way, I was agnostic for most of my adolescence. As an agnostic, I have to have faith. I have to believe that there is not enough information to make an informed decision about God. That's a subjective opinion, one that clearly many people disagree with and have disagreed with throughout history. The big question for me is this. Has the agnostic really thought through the issues? Has the agnostic truly weighed the information, the data, the evidence? Or has the agnostic blindly accepted agnosticism as a default stance? assuming it to be the most reasonable position. Is the agnostic a fetist? Does the agnostic have blind faith or faith supported by reason? These are the big questions. See, the question is not whether the agnostic has faith. The question is what kind of faith does the agnostic have? That's what I care most about. For me, when I was agnostic, I didn't have the categories necessary to think through these things in a logical manner and to make an informed decision either way. I didn't know where to begin. I think that most people struggle with this and find themselves in a similar position. But a lack of awareness is not the same thing as a lack of information. A lack of knowledge of the evidence is not the same thing as a lack of evidence itself. Soren Kierkegaard is a really helpful source and companion on this. One of Kierkegaard's biggest things was the importance of making a decision and living into it. He understood that truth was experienced in decision and in a personal history that participates in that decision. This is why he's known as the father of existentialism. He was a theist and a Christian, which is ironic because many modern existentialists that followed in his footsteps are agnostics and atheists. 
If this is true of agnosticism, then this is certainly true of atheism. The atheist is a believer, a person of faith, and often possesses a lot of the same characteristics that the religious person possesses. See, the question of God is a debatable question by definition. It is not a question that can ever be definitively answered in space-time. One can't prove with absolute certainty that God exists. But neither can one prove with any certainty that God doesn't exist. This is why the question has been debated throughout history and will continue to be debated until time ceases. If theism and atheism are not matters of fact, then they are matters of belief and matters of faith. There are super intelligent people on both sides of this debate, which is why the kind of insults and mockery that you hear from both sides is entirely uncalled for. You are not dumb or stupid for believing that God doesn't exist. In fact, some of the smartest and sharpest people that I know don't believe in God. But that said, you are also not dumb and stupid if you believe in God. Some of the smartest people to ever walk this earth were believers in the traditional sense. In my opinion, this is not a matter of intelligence. This is not a matter of IQ, but a matter of human subjectivity. Once again, my main concern is with blind faith which can be found on both sides of the issue. It is one thing to place faith into something without any evidence. It is another thing to support my faith with rational argumentation. In the same way, it's one thing to reject the reality of something thoughtlessly, as a blind expression of dismissiveness. It is another thing to base my rejection on sound reasoning and serious thought. There are theists who have blind faith, and there are theists who have rational faith. There are atheists who have blind faith, and there are atheists who have rational faith. I personally believe that in every area of life, but especially with the big questions of life, an informed decision is always better than an uninformed decision. So again, The question is not whether the atheist has faith. The question is what kind of faith does the atheist have? I don't have to say anything about the theist here, about me, because we already assume and know that the theist, that I, am a person of faith. Matters of faith and the question of God are sensitive subjects. I think a lot of people have been hurt in the crossfires. Part of it is that we take these things so personally. It's hard not to. Our identities are often wrapped up in these questions. Our lifestyles are born out of them. We attach our intelligence to them as representations or symbols of our intellect. We prop ourselves up and put people down. I don't want to do that. If I'm honest and totally transparent, I've been hurt by some of this stuff. For better or worse, I do take some of these assumptions and stereotypes personally. Kind of like Michael Jordan. The idea that because I'm a believer in the traditional sense, I must be unreasonable, I must not be very intelligent, I must be pretty gullible, I must not be very critical or skeptical, is offensive. It's hard not to take that assumption personally. Over the last five to ten years or so, for whatever reason, I have found myself in a lot of uncomfortable social settings and situations. Situations where people will, out of nowhere, completely unsolicited, make derogatory remarks about religion, faith, and Christianity either directly at me or right in front of me. For some odd reason, 
I've become a magnet for anti-religious bigotry. Whether people know I'm religious or not, rude and inconsiderate comments, often filled with hate and mockery, will be made about faith or Christianity right in front of my face. And I'm just standing or sitting there silently, biting my tongue, or trying to change the subject. We carry these things with us. They are wounds that become scars over time. But this is just my subjective experience. People who are not religious have experienced the same kinds of things at the hands of those who are religious. Much of the hostility on both sides comes from hurt and pain. People who are in pain lash out at others, which creates a kind of vicious cycle of hostility and pain, an unending chain of anger and hurt. Of course, there is something to be said about the importance of having tough skin. No doubt about it. But there's also something to be said about the importance of sound thinking and sound communication. The importance of ethical thinking and ethical communication. Things that I have discussed in length on this podcast. I hope it's been made clear by now that the main goal of Thinker Sensitive is not to convince people that my way is right. It's not to get people to believe exactly what I believe. The main purpose of the podcast is to get people to think. To get people to think through these questions with me. Regardless of where that thinking may lead. And where it ultimately leads is your choice. It's not mine to make. I can't make your decisions for you. And I don't want to. But what I want to do is to help inspire rational faith and informed decisions. Whatever that faith is placed in and wherever those decisions may lead. Thanks for choosing to think through this stuff with me. To participate on this journey with me and to be a companion with me in thought. This episode, and all episodes of Thinker Sensitive, are available at thinkersensitive.com, iTunes, Spotify, and more. If you enjoy our content and wish to donate to help us grow our online community of thinkers, please visit thinkersensitive.com.